turning westbound onto 13th. I have one white female. Black males continuing. Black leather coat, red pants. I will have one at gunpoint. Have you one at gunpoint? Drop the gun! Drop the gun! Drop the gun now! Drop it! Get on the ground! Get on the ground! I'll shoot you! Get on the ground! Get on the ground! Get on the ground! Get on the ground! Roll over on your stomach! Roll over on your stomach! Now I have the female coming up behind me. I need units now. Stay on the ground! Female, get on the ground! Do not move! Don't move! Get your hands up! What is it? You're Sir, why did you reach in your pants? No, roll on your stomach! Roll on your stomach! Stay down! Call one nine, be advised. Suspect reached for his waist, shots fired. Stay down! Stay where you are! I'm directly under the freeway. I have one male proned out. I have shots fired. Kilo 25 has a female. Yeah. Stay there! Don't move! Don't move! 39, 10, 10, 33, it's all late. 10, 15. Roll over. Where are you hit? Where? What were you reaching for? I was just reaching right here for No, dude, you went in your hands. Stop! Sit down, sit down. That was it. Female. I don't know, get him. Umbrella. What is good, my people? We are live back again with another episode of The Forecast. Now, my brothers and sisters, we are at a point right now we shouldn't be trying to convince anybody else of anything. Right now, we are past the point of having to empower ourselves. We should have been past this point a hundred years ago. And by the way, they were because they didn't try to convince white people not to be racist. They just said, hey, we'll focus on our own fucking towns. We'll grow our own economies. We'll stick with each other. We'll have strong families. We'll have a strong economy. They did that. It's no point of trying to convince them or beg them for anything. This whole protest thing speaks for itself. Colin Kaepernick did a great thing, and it's affecting the league. But you can see that this race thing goes beyond any of that. It's not about the messenger. It's not about the way you present the message. The problem is the message itself. This is about equality. This is about unity and love and growing together as a society and starting a conversation around something that may be a little uncomfortable for people. But we got to come together and talk about these things and grow as a, as, a, as a community, as a connected group of individuals in our society. And we're going to continue to show love and unity. And this week, we're going to ask the fans to join in as well and come together and, and show people that we can be connected and we can grow together. The problem isn't the flag. It isn't the national anthem disrespecting the the military or anything like that. The problem is the message of inequality in the justice system. The people against Kaepernick will probably be the same crowd of people who will tell you that those black people armed or unarmed deserve to be shot by the police. They can't say, well, you're disrespecting the military because they don't give a fuck about the military when it's black soldiers. They bring up World War II. Well, how was the black soldiers treated? You bring up today. Well, if I join the army and take my military off, am I seen as a black man? Yes, I am. 
they can't blame it on the messenger because recently Aaron Rodgers came out and said, hey, we need to focus on this racial inequality. How can you be against that? And diehard Packers fans who anybody who knows football, especially if you're a Packers fan, you know how beloved Aaron Rodgers is by his fans, but they will turn on him because at the end of the day, it's bigger than football for them. This is a way of life. And it damn sure better be about more than football for us because our people are out here dying. And if it's not at the hands of the police or because of poverty or violence in our own communities, it's because we ain't eating healthy. It's because we ain't eating right. We should be pissed off that we not controlling our own economy, controlling our own grocery stores, controlling what we eat and what we don't eat. People dying from diabetes, high blood pressure, and it comes mostly from being uneducated. And we should be pissed off that we're not educating our own children. We're not in control of what the curriculum our children learn is. We are sent to school to learn enough to go work for some corporation. And generation through generation, we have been passing down this work for somebody else mentality, or we choose voluntary servitude. We need to pass generational wealth down to our children. We need to build our own businesses right now. I mean, right now we need to set up an election with the brightest, smartest, most successful business people in the black community that we trust, we can nominate them and actually have an election to set up a board strictly to fund and grow black businesses. And of course, make sure they stay transparent and make sure they always do what they say they're going to do or just stop sending your money if something doesn't look right about it. But we need to build our own economy. Like these players in the NFL, if every single player, just the players who agree with Kaepernick, if they kneeled and they all got fired, they could start their own league and they would probably have the best players in the league. It's not but so much the NFL can do to the players because the players make up the NFL. Without the players, there is no NFL. We have the Negro Leagues. And they were doing just fine. And these players were getting paid. And we were going out to see them. Because money was circulated in the black community. They had no other choice. And guess what? We don't have another choice. We have an illusion of a choice. It's okay to give our money away. But it is not okay for us to talk about justice. And at this point... You know what? It's not okay for us to talk about justice. It's time for us to make our own justice. It only matters what happens in our own community. These people already know what they're doing. They wouldn't trade places with you. Shit, there ain't a white man in this room that would change places with me. None of them would change places with me, and I'm rich. person in this room who would be happy to be treated as this society in general treats our citizens, our black citizens, if you as a white person would be happy to receive the same treatment that our black citizens do in this society, please stand. You didn't understand the directions. If you white folks want to be treated the way blacks are in this society, stand. Nobody's standing here. That says very plainly that you know what's happening. You know you don't want it for you. I want to know why you're so willing to accept it or to allow it to happen for others.
Don't waste your time trying to convince them otherwise. Leave that up to the other white people who understand what's going on and believe in the change. Because guess what? Anytime you speak up for injustice, it may seem like you're against all white people, but you're not. You're against fucking injustice. And at this point, I don't care who feels what way about what. Our people have to come together. Forget all this divide and conquer nonsense. Our lives are more important than the things we're arguing over. If you believe in Christianity and still want to go to church, go to a church that gives back to the black community. If you want to be involved in Islam, be a part of a community that gives back to the community. Those are ignorant things to be divided over at a time where we are all under attack. Men, women, children. And we shouldn't be taking any casualties. I don't care if it's one man and I don't care if it's one baby. The time is now for us to come together and rise up and do what we got to do. This is the information age. We are connected more than ever. We have all of these storms everywhere killing people. We have two world leaders with nuclear weapons talking shit to each other. Now is the time to create our own nation so that we can protect ourselves, so that we can empower ourselves, so that we can build whatever we need to build. And most importantly, protect it, protect ourselves right now. And it doesn't happen overnight. But if we start right now, before we know it, we'll be in a position to take the next step. And then the step after that. Once we build our economy, we can start building our schools, teach our children to be doctors and lawyers and be important things that we need as a society, as the black community. Like before, where we taught black children to be scientists, to be doctors, to be lawyers. Like the Cosby show with the Huxtables, that was a normal thing in the 40s and 30s. And when we build our economy, we can put people to work, which will cut down on the poverty. And we'll be able to have our own political arena in our own communities where we can at least protect our own communities, have people representing us that we want to represent us. They always have given us our representatives. It's time for us to start picking our own representatives. The people who pick the police force in your area, who Control where your local tax dollars go. We have got to realize the urgency that we are dealing with. Because it's not just the police killing somebody or the police stopping you or searching you. It's greater than sending your children to school to be miseducated, to be taught to be a voluntary servant. They control everything. They control what the water we drink, they control our diet, they control what we watch on TV. We have to start being in control of what we eat, being doctors to help heal our sick instead of feeding off of a culture designed to make us sick. At the end of the day, we have to put the next generation, our predecessors, in a position to be empowered where they can control their own nation, where they have a say over their own laws, be in control of their own wealth. It's up to us to put them in position. Caught on camera, excessive force, a police officer seen on video punching a man who had his hands up during a traffic stop. Then another officer arrives and stomps on the man's face. The two officers have been terminated from the Gwinnett County Police Department in Georgia. Here's CBS News correspondent Mark Strassman. Pick your phone out. It's out, it's out. As Demetrius Hollins got out of his car with his hands up Wednesday, he was punched in the face by Gwinnett County Police Sergeant Michael Bongiovanni. Moments later, he was also tased. This video, recorded by a passerby, shows Hollins later handcuffed and lying on the ground. He is face down when Officer Robert McDonald, arriving as backup, appears to stomp on Hollins' head. I'm literally sick about it. Literally sick. Gwinnett County Police Chief Butch Ayers said his sergeant reported the responding officer's misconduct, but not his own. There was a struggle. There was nothing about a punch. 
the incident that was depicted upon that video was not uh, mentioned or described in those reports. The arrest report said Bon Giovanni pulled Hollins over for an unusual lane change and driving without license plates. After he claims Hollins acted strange and angry, Bon Giovanni says he deployed my taser and performed a leg sweep. All I can say is I don't, I wish this never happened to me. His face bloodied and bruised. Hollins was bailed out of the county jail by his attorney on Thursday. He's doing okay right now. We just want to get him to the hospital and get him checked out. Hired in 2013, Officer McDonald had three previous instances of use of force. He was also honored with three years good conduct last August. Officer McDonald accepted responsibility for his actions. But the chief said the fired Sergeant Bon Giovanni offered this explanation. It's different out on the streets. Bon Giovanni said in his police report that Hollins resisted arrest and that he recognized Hollins from a previous arrest. The police chief here says he hopes to have his force wearing body cameras by the end of the year. A former police officer fired after a viral video showed him punching a man in a traffic stop wants his job back. Channel 2's Lori Wilson spoke with his attorney about the appeal. She's live in Gwinnett County. Lori? I just spoke with former officer turned attorney Michael Puglis, who is representing former Sergeant Michael Bongiovanni. He explained to me how the appeals process works. Bongiovanni will be granted a hearing in front of a five person merit board where he can challenge his termination. It's his action on video that he is going to have to defend. We've got it for you. Uh, it was a traffic stop of 21 year old Demetrius Hollins on April 12th near Lawrenceville. Two videos surfaced one showing Master Officer Robert McDonald kicking Hollins while he was handed cuffed on the ground that led to McDonald's firing. Another video showed Sergeant Bon Giovanni using what he calls an FBI taught technique of an elbow to the head. He's seen using that elbow while Hollins has his hands in the air. The attorney for Bon Giovanni says perhaps the technique needs to be questioned, but don't fire the officer for using a method he was trained to use. The masses want this officer crucified and in some places they want all officers crucified. There's this division between the public and, and, and the officer. And all we're asking is don't automatically flow with the masses. Take a momentary pause. Just rest. Get all the facts in and then make your decision. Nearly 90 cases connected to two Georgia police officers caught on camera beating a handcuffed man last week have been thrown out. The Gwinnett County solicitor says she is dropping all cases involving Robert McDonald or Michael Bongiovanni. Getting our hands on some video that shows what happened after a bizarre confrontation in Port Charlotte. A 12 year old got punched so hard it knocked some of his teeth out. Four in the corners, Deborah Souverain finding out the man who threw the punch says he did it in self defense after that kid and his friends threatened him coming onto his property. Deb? Amy and Patrick, the child says he never actually stepped foot on the man's property, but he does admit to walking over to him after he heard the man yelling. We also spoke to the man who punched the child in the face. He says the children were blocking traffic and he simply wanted them to go home. 12 year old Malachi and his friends say they were on their way home from school when a man began yelling at them. He was screaming at us, cursing at us, calling us the N word. And then he came down into the middle of his yard and I was like, who are you talking to? And then he came down to the sidewalk and said, uh, come in arm's length and I'll show you what I'm talking about. This is what he says his face looked like after the incident. When I realized my teeth were dangling in my mouth, it was kind of shocking. I didn't know what was going on. It was like a nightmare. I just knew I had to get there and I had to get there fast. The boy's parents are upset because the man who did this to Malachi was not arrested. Where is it okay for an adult to take the law into his own hands and to strike a kid hard enough to knock out his teeth? Where is that acceptable? In what country is that acceptable? According to this incident report, the man who punched Malachi was 27-year-old Vincent Cervallo. Originally, this is where the altercation took place, right here. He spoke to Fournier Corner to tell his side of the story. I told him that they all need to back off, and if they come on my property, I'm going to defend myself. And they were just like, you won't hit us, you won't hit us. And they, they started to surround me. He says it all started when he yelled at the kids to get out of the road because they were blocking traffic. This cell phone video captures the moments after Malachi was punched. Vincent says he acted in self-defense. He touched me and I let my hand out and I, I ended up hitting him. It was not my intention to hit anybody that hard. It was not my intention to knock teeth out. It was not my intention to do harm or just cause any kind of trouble. Vincent says he never expected things to escalate to violence. And now he's pressing charges against 12-year-old Malachi for assault.
something the teen and his parents can understand. He's not going to jail and nothing's happening to him and he's basically getting away with it right now. I want the man in jail. The state attorney's office will be reviewing this case and Vincent tells us he's been receiving death threats ever since images of Malachi began making rounds on social media. Today we saw a deputy escort him from his home for safety reasons. The children say they just want justice. Action to the Steelers controversy is all over social media and tonight a local volunteer fire chief is apologizing for something he said on Facebook. Ralph Iannotti is live with more on why it's causing such a stir. Ralph. Yeah, thanks very much, Susan. A fire chief here in Washington County says it was a case of bad judgment, but nonetheless, uh, there are a lot of eyebrows being raised here tonight in Washington County and some sharp reaction as well. Oh, say can you see the fallout continues after the Steelers game on Sunday and the team's decision to stay in the tunnel in Soldier Field in Chicago during the national anthem before the team headed out onto the field. And some of the reaction crossed the line. Paul Smith, the chief of the Cecil Volunteer Fire Station No. 2 in Washington County, posted a derogatory response on Facebook, directing a racial slur at head coach Mike Tomlin. Reaction to Smith's post in Cecil Township was quick and negative. Yeah, I'm completely upset, especially for a town like this coming from the, the fire chief. That's disrespectful in my eyes. In my point of view, I don't agree with it one bit. For a fire chief or for anybody of public authority, authority to come out and say something like that is wrong. They don't need to be in that position. Not good. No. Don't like it at all. Kind of a dumb thing to do, I think. And uh, there's enough tension in this country over black and white, and he's definitely adding to it. Fire Chief Smith is out of the country on vacation, but on Facebook, he responded to us saying, I am I want to apologize. I was frustrated and angry at the Steelers not standing for the anthem. This had nothing to do with my fire department. Now, I reached out tonight to the Cecil Township manager. He didn't uh, respond to our phone call. And uh, some firefighters here were in a training exercise earlier tonight. They came back here to the fire station about an hour ago, but they said they really didn't want to comment on this incident. The people, and I'm a person, I know some people don't believe that, are angry about this NFL because it's a much bigger story than football players. And I, and I want to address this comment to the NFL players today, and they'll get this. When the Jaguars and the Ravens were over in London and they kneeled down on a foreign soil and then they stood up for the British national God anthem, save the Queen. I was angry and sad because I don't believe those players know what they're doing. About 3,000 miles east of you, there are American military people in Kandahar, Afghanistan, whose entertainment revolves around the Armed Forces Network that broadcasts football games. Now, I was over there in seven. I watched football games with them. Can you imagine putting your life on the line in Afghanistan and having just a leisure time and wanting to watch a football game and seeing your players, your American players, disrespect the country and the flag on foreign soil? Can you imagine how painful that was? Can I ask you this? Was? How could they possibly not know? They don't Why know. do you give... These, they don't Most know. of these, these players... They look, they're the best of the best. I have great respect for their athletic talent, their ability, their agility, their hard work. You, they went to college, Bill. Most of these kids play college ball. It's a mob mentality. It, it is an anti-Trump demonstration. That's what it's morphed into. But there's two kinds of dissent. And, and nobody, nobody is saying the players don't have a right to their opinion about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They, you do. You, and if you want to feel America is an evil country where the white supremacists stalk innocent blacks, if you want to believe that, you're free to believe it. But it's not true. It's not true. So there's informed dissent. And then there is pack mincent dissent when that's where we're into now pack dissent okay so he says one thing i say another and the league and the owners have lost control of it but the american people i firmly believe 65 percent maybe 70 percent of the american people do not like this situation are offended by this situation how much of this is related i i played president obama he rushed to judgment when it came to Baltimore and Freddie Gray and 
it never happened, hands up, don't shoot. And Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman. Now, I learned when I was in Atlanta, local radio guy, you don't rush to judgment. That was in the Richard Jewell case. But the president at the time rushed to judgment. That narrative, people believe hands up, don't shoot happened. A lot of people believe propaganda, and there's nothing we can do about it. I mean, they want to change everything. The Constitution, the economic system, the leadership, the electoral system. They want to cross the board change. Well, First of all, the league is going to have to do something. And what they should do, as I wrote, I wrote a column for The Hill about it, um, is say to the players, we know that some of you don't like the country or, or, or want to get a point across. But this is the wrong forum. All right? This is not the forum to do it. So if you don't want to stand up for the national anthem, stay in the locker room and then come out. But we don't want any political demonstrations because we don't allow pro-American demonstrations. The league does not allow that. <laughs> there were many, many giant players, New York giant and jet players, that after 9-11 wanted to show on their uniforms Absolutely. their solidarity with the families. Year, Bill, they wouldn't the, allow it. They, we had the slaughter of cops in Dallas. And the they Cowboys wouldn't allow it. wanted to honor the local right. police. On they wouldn't helmet. let them. They wouldn't let them. So you've got to be consistent. So the league says, all right, you guys who don't want to stand up for the national anthem, you stay in a locker room after it's over, you can come out. That's it. But there is a reason why it's happening. A year ago, you did not hear the words white supremacist. Didn't hear it. Nobody heard it. It was white privilege. And in my Levittown neighborhood, about eight miles away from Hannity's Franklin Square no, I was miles away. I had guys, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, in undershirts that are falling apart. Going, Where's my white privilege? All right. OK. That's what you had a year ago. It's morphed into white supremacists now. Mm -hmm. And people are buying it. Why? Because the far left agents, and I think they're evil, want to ho destroy the Constitution in the sense that they want it all changed. It, who forged it? Slave owners, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington. We can't have a Constitution with they made. We have to have a new one. That's the end game. You were on my radio show, and I think this was the most important point you made that I agreed with that I think is the most dangerous for the country. Because you took on the monument issue. Now you can add the NFL issue. Right. And institutions in this country that are under fire every day. I'll add to that the two to four year playing of the race card, the, the only one of the big weapons in the playbook of the Democrats. But ultimately, you say if they get rid of the monuments, they get rid of our history, they can take a knee during the anthem and diss the flag, then ultimately it's really the Constitution they want to change. That's make, right. I want you to make that point. They're after a, they don't want capitalism. They don't want the electoral college. They don't want white people generally calling the shots. So it, they have to mobilize minority Americans to be angry. Mm -hmm. You know, we do this on BillOReilly.com almost every night. I'm, I'm paralleling you on, on our website. But if you understand history, and most people don't. All right, and we back on the forecast. So really, at the end of the day, it's simple. It's whether we want shit to change, whether we want to control our own destinies or not. We have to understand that these people in the white dominant society, they are not stupid, but again, they are not necessarily smart either. If there's a black entertainment network, shouldn't there be a white entertainment network? Do you say sorta of racist stuff but stop short of saying the n-word? Enjoy the refreshing taste of diet racism. The same sweet ignorance of regular racism, but with none of the guilt or self-awareness. You know I'm not racist, but I would never date an Asian guy. Ugh. Diet racism. Because you're afraid of blacks and Latinos, but you'd never say that out loud. It's the perfect beverage for people who don't directly contribute to oppression, but have strong opinions about how other cultures should handle it. Stop oppression shouldn't be a problem if you got nothing to hide. For that busy, on-the-go professional who doesn't have the strength to admit he's been given at least a slight advantage by being born white. The Irish were persecuted too, you know. For the stay-at-home mom who hates affirmative action because she doesn't remember that black kids had to be escorted to school by the army. My kids would have a way easier time getting into college if they were minorities. <laughs> Diet racism. Because you just don't get it. The official beverage of the Washington Redskins.
they got into the position they are in off of sheer brutality. They set out to create slaves, and in 2017, it's still working. They put those images in your head through sheer brutality. They show them to you over and over and over until it sticks in your head. They tell you the same thing for hundreds of years until you say, well, it must be right. You've been saying it for hundreds of years. But at the end of the day, what they say and do should be of no importance to us at all. And I'm not saying to not study your opponents, because you should learn everything about your enemy that you can. But we have allowed ourselves to be miseducated so much to the point that we call ourselves minority. We are not the minority in this world. It's the art of war. When you are outnumbered, you divide your enemy into two. Divide and conquer. It's a simple technique, but it's very effective. And we allow ourselves to be divided about all kind of stupid stuff, irrelevant stuff. We are all divided on the surface level. But beneath all of that, we are in the same position. We all have the same core agreement, especially as black people, that we ain't trying to go back to the 1800s. Even those of us who was called house niggas, they ain't trying to go back to be a house slave. But we still divided along those colorism lines, light skin versus dark skin. And we know we had that light skin versus dark skin complex, but we don't understand where it comes from. Back then, when these white slave masters were raping these black slave women and impregnating them, the baby would come out mixed. And some of these slave owners treated them like the rest of the black slaves. And some of the slave owners treated them like they were their son. Carruthers was actually the wealthiest African-American in the 19th century. So from that alone, you could tell that he did very well for himself. Quite well, almost an understatement for a man born into slavery. But even that wasn't the most intriguing part of John Carruthers Stanley's heritage. History tells us that his father was the man that lived in this house just across the street from the Tryon Palace. Carruthers was a recognized son of the wealthy and powerful John Wright Stanley and a slave of the Igbo tribe. That kind of recognition was quite uncommon in the 1800s. No, it really wasn't common, but I guess he was proud of his son and they petitioned for his freedom. That Despite that freedom and wealth that allowed Carruthers to purchase these properties and buy much of his family out of slavery, it was the matter of who Carruthers' parents were that placed him in a precarious situation. Like that of many in the emerging biracial South, their physical features betraying them as only black, their bloodline denying them full benefits of a white person. That was the case with Carruthers and his white half-brother, John Stanley Jr. John Carruthers Stanley and his brother were able to attend that church with, of course, Carruthers sitting in the back of the church with his family and the other brother Stanley sitting in the front with his family. Despite the challenges, Carruthers navigated the rough waters of discrimination to make the best of an imperfect situation in a time where choices didn't always present themselves as black or white. He was an apprentice as a barber, which was common in that time for slaves, and he was the largest African-American slave owner in his time. And then you would have these mixed kids who would inherit slaves and be as bad or sometimes even worse than the full-blooded white slave owner in the first place. And of course, today they would say, well, other black people own slaves too. And you hear or well, black people sold other black people into slavery and try to put a divide in between us and the people in Africa. But that's another tactic from the art of war. When the enemy is weak, then you attack. And after a thousand years of the Arab slave trade, of course Africa is in a weakened state from being in so many wars. So it was easy for the Europeans to go into a village, kill everybody, then go to the next village and say, well, if you don't come with us or go get another tribe, then we will do you like we did those last villages or just enslave you. But now today they say, well, the Africans sold you out. Well, what I don't understand is 
if Arab sold slaves and they got wealthy, if Europeans sold slaves, they got wealthy, Americans sold slaves, they got wealthy, the Africans sold their own people and they lost all of their wealth, why in the hell would they do that? But when I think about all of this talk about Africans hating us and us hating Africans, it really comes from the white narrative. It really comes from the narrative of white society. And we have to start controlling our own narratives, at least with ourselves. It doesn't matter what they think or feel. It only matters the narrative that we give ourselves. Because when we go by their narratives, it only leads to more divides, like divide between black men and black women. Now, black men and black women have to be on the same page. We can't do it without our women, and our women cannot do it without us. We have got to work together. But every time we begin to get on the same page, another narrative comes out. During slavery, families were ripped apart. They would take a baby from its mother. They would come into the home and take a man's wife away just to be raped. And he couldn't do anything about it. But even then, the black families did not break up. They would do anything in their power to be a family. Some people would buy their freedom and then go buy their wife or their children's freedom, which would account for more of those black slave owners that they love to talk about. And then after slavery, we had the most two-parent homes. And then they came in and destroyed all of our cities, destroyed our economy, and then they were in charge of whether we were going to work or not. And so they said, well, you know what? We'll tell you what. We'll give the women and the children a place to stay. We'll give them food. And we'll give them health care. As long as the husband and the man is out of the house. And that effectively destroyed the black community. Because back then, black men couldn't get jobs in the 1960s, 1950s. 1940s, after the businesses and everything that they had were destroyed. And then they complain about doing that and say, well, you know, you got your welfare and all of this and that. Be grateful. They use it as a sign of you being inferior, as if that wasn't the plan in the first place. And let's be clear, it's not just a problem in the black community because they love to talk about the black single mothers, the problem with the black single mothers. People better start paying attention because that's an American problem. The American marriage system, the way it's set up, does not work, especially for men, period. The way the divorce laws are set up is designed to break up families. And with so much miseducation, people growing up in houses without two parents that love each other and show you how it's done. People are growing up confused. Today, most people are masochist. They enjoy being hurt because that's all they knew through their whole life. Women don't know how to pick a man because she didn't see a father who treated her mother the way she was supposed to be treated. Men don't know how to pick a woman because he don't see a mother who treated a father how she's supposed to be treated. And it's important for us in the black community if we want to change things. That's the first place that change happens in the home with the children. They shape the next generation's mind. Our parents are the first teachers. We should be instilling into our children's heads how to be financially stable, financially independent, financially wealthy. We need to teach them how to make their money work for them, how to manage their money. To teach them to get into science. To teach them to go to school for medicine. To go to school to be a lawyer. And if we continue this divide between black men and black women, that leaves our children vulnerable for another generation to come up being taught by European principles and to make things even worse. 
That's why it's important for us to put aside our petty differences and to change things right now because we don't have any time to waste. People is dying every single day. If not from police, if not from poverty, if not from each other, then just from lack of education, from a poor diet, or you're working every day until you're 70 to make some white man filthy rich while you struggling every day check to check. It's time to change all of that. We don't have time to waste. You watch Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones is my shit. Man, that's what I love about you. It's like, you're a black dude, but you don't act black. What? What I mean is like, you don't act all like, like thugged oh, so out. so all black people are thugged out? Oh, man. Oops, I was raised as black guy, come here. How can I help you? I was trying to bond with my black coworker, but things got racist real fast. Hey man, he's all right, he's a really good guy. What yeah. he meant to say was is that he finds it extremely refreshing that you yeah. manage to somehow yeah, defy yeah. racial stereotypes, right. remain your own person, rooted but not bound to the black experience, which is culturally astonishing for him because he comes from Milwaukee and his father's a redneck. He said all that. He's cool, oh, man. man. He ain't got a auntie house all the time, man. Eat place of food. Love her. It's good food. It's good guy. Okay, if you say so. Thank God for racism insurance. There when you need it most. Racism insurance. You are so hot. <sighs> and I'm not into black girls, like, at all. But there's something about you. Wait, excuse me? Is that your real hair? <laughs> what? Do you have Indian in your family? You know what? <gasps> Oops, I was raised. It's black guy, come here. <sighs> really, Keith? That's what you led with. You know what? I, no. My friend here, he got a little hung up with your, your beauty. Wait, y'all are friends? Me and Keith? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, we go way back. Yeah, we was at my crib actually watching BET, having a conversation about how a black woman has an unparalleled beauty. It's second to none. Uh, black girls rock so hard. And that was really sweet. You owe me, Ryan Gosling. You owe me. Racism insurance. For those times that you just kind of weren't thinking. It wasn't even my shoes, man. You know? So, you can't trust these hoes. Can't trust these yeah. hoes. You can't trust hoes. Whoa, man, you can't say that. Why not? Because we're talking about black hoes. Now, we can call black women hoes, yeah. but you can't. I just thought I couldn't say nigga. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is wrong with you, man? You cannot use the N-word. It's not covered in your policy, man. Oh, yeah, you on your own. Nah, they mad. You fucked up. Please don't jump me, please. We're not going to jump you. What do you think this is? We're in Westwood, man. Yeah, bro. We're just going to intellectually denigrate and scold you for the abuse of your white privilege. What's white privilege? Racism insurance for everything but it? the N-word. Really? This is a moment that people are talking about tonight when wide receiver Andrew Hawkins walked out of the tunnel onto the field wearing a statement shirt calling for justice for Tamir Rice. The 12-year-old boy shot and killed in a confrontation with Cleveland police. News Channel 5's Nick Foley is live at First Energy Stadium tonight. And Nick, the uh, Cleveland Police Patrolman's Association, what are they calling for tonight? Well, Tracy, it's safe to say they are not happy about it at all. That short wor shirt worn by Hawkins called for justice for Rice, as you mentioned, and also for John Crawford, a man who was shot and killed by Dayton police in a Walmart back in August holding a replica gun. Now, that shirt, of course, is Hawkins' opinion, but his gesture now has the CPPA calling on the Browns for what they believe is some needed damage control. A silent statement made by Andrew Hawkins, and one that some Browns fans that were in the stadium for the game say Hawkins had every right to make. It's freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and what and what he did is what was in his heart. Everybody has a right to express their opinion, especially about something that might ring home to them, you know, urban type issues, and it's important to know these things and what's going on today in today's society. But the Cleveland Police Patrolmen's Association does not see it the same way. I talked to Union President Jeff Fulmer by phone, who gave this statement to News Channel 5, saying, quote, It's pretty pathetic when athletes think they know the law. They should stick to what they know best on the field. The Cleveland Police protect and serve the Browns Stadium, and the Browns organization owes us an apology. End of quote. Earlier this week in Brooklyn, LeBron James wore an I Can't Breathe shirt in support of Eric Garner, who died in New York while being arrested by police. Another example of an athlete using a national forum to express a personal opinion. But fans say just like the NBA, or in this case the NFL, can choose to punish the athletes for taking a stand, the players can decide it's worth the consequences. They can still say something, but he still has the freedom to do it. They can still, they can, I'm quite sure he make enough money to, to write that check or whatever not, but sometimes things is bigger than work and bigger than money. And that's one of them.
Now, I reached out to the Browns organization for their take on the matter. I hold, heard back from the team just a short time ago. We want to read you now the statement released to me. We have great respect for the Cleveland Police Department and the work they do to protect and serve our city. We also respect our players' rights to project their support and bring awareness to issues that are important to them if done so in a responsible manner. Now, I also talked to a Brown spokesman, and I asked him if Hawkins would face any sort of punishment or fine for his gesture and wearing that shirt today at the game. Simple reply was no. We're going to turn our attention now to one of the biggest stories around the country today, and that is the NFL's response to recent comments from President Trump that he made on Twitter. He essentially called for players who refused to stand for the national anthem to be fired or suspended. What was the reaction from the NASCAR community today on this issue, Nate? Well, I should probably preface this, Carolyn, by saying that, you know, per our coverage and from reporters on the scene, it didn't appear as if there were any protests that happened before the race today among uh, team members. There were a few team owners that were asked about uh, the protest before the race. Richard Childress told reporters that anyone who worked for him who took a knee uh, would need to get a bus ticket if they wanted to get home, implying that they would be fired. He said it was about respecting the country. Richard Petty told USA Today Sports that anybody who didn't stand up for the flag should leave the country. And Joe Gibbs, who of course is a former NFL coach, he was asked about it before and after the race. He said that he didn't discuss the issue with his team. After the race, he said that so much has been sacrificed for our country and our flag. It's a big deal for us to honor America. That's the way we looked at it. He said that he couldn't speak for all members of his race team, Carolyn, but he felt that everybody, a consensus opinion, shared his thoughts. All right. The NRA has released a new ad tackling the protest, the anthem protests. Watch this. Every time I see our flag wave, I feel a humbling reminder of the brave who keep and have kept us free. I stand to honor the sacrifices of the generations before me. Heroes who charged in the battle through bombs and bullets, who lost their brothers and still pushed through, fighting for every inch of our freedom. I stand for my brothers who can't stand anymore. Men who hunted terrorists to the ends of the earth, who sacrificed their bodies and their lives so that we could peacefully live ours. I stand for the children, the spouses, and parents whose family made the ultimate sacrifice for us. We are all standing. All right, that man in the ad is a former U.S. Navy SEAL. He joins us now. Welcome, everyone. This is Dom Arasso. Dom, welcome to the program. Great to see you, sir. Thank you. Nice for having me on. The ad does not mention the NFL, but that's exactly where it's aimed. Am I right? Yeah, I mean, at, at the end of the day, you know, we need to be talking about honor first. So it's about putting America first. You know, it could be any organization, and I think we're going to see the same things. You know, we're, we're bringing it up an issue where people are pissed off. People are pissed off about the reaction yeah. and the actions that our people are taking, and we have to remember the foundation that this has all been built on. I think the NFL is the big loser here. I want to break you away from the NRA for a minute and just look at this situation here. seems to me it's the NFL which is the loser. They're not enforcing the rules that are in their own rule book, and they seem to be just in chaos about this whole issue. What do you say? Well, like I said, Americans are upset. You know, yeah, it are. doesn't matter what issue you're talking about. It's the foundation of everything that we've built here. I know I'm pretty damn proud of where we've come as a country, and we all need to take a look around and look at the freedom that we've got. You know, I'm disappointed. There is nobody that I know more than me that wants to see us united, have great leadership, and then honor all of those who have gone before us. And at the end of the day, I am disappointed in leadership and some of the decisions that were made, but it's a learning point. It's a learning lesson, and that's why, that's why America has been so great, because you know what we'll do with this? We'll take this and we'll continue to figure out ways to bring us all back together with putting honor first. But at this moment, I think you're quite right. Most Americans are really angry at what they see going on on their screens, Monday night football, Sunday night football. I think you've expressed the mood of America very accurately. I think people are, as you say, thoroughly angry. Last word to you. The, there's no doubt about it. Everybody's looking at this right now and everybody's paying attention. And we have to have good leadership. Everything I said in my video, the brothers that I've lost, the families that have sacrificed so much, 
It's timing. I'm not saying there's not important issues we need to talk about, but it's the timing that you pick to bring it up. Don't bring it up when we're talking about putting America first, honor first, and look at the foundation that we've been built on. Did, did you go to the NRA to suggest you make that ad, or did they come to you? You know, it's always been a joint effort about putting our rights first, whether it's the Second Amendment, the First Amendment. They're all things that are extremely important to me. This specific subject, it hit home. It means a lot to me. And I know that I'm in a position in order to convey that education. When I look at the people that take the actions that they're taking, sometimes I just realize that they don't know any better. And we have to continue to bring what's important and what's valuable to this country. Last one, Dom. The next football game on TV, NFL football game, will you watch? We have to be aware of what's going on. And unfortunately, you can see a lot of people reacting. I see people burning jerseys, canceling their mm -hmm. tickets. You know, I've taken small actions in my own life to mitigate some of that because of the values. But it's still a point where we can turn this into good leadership. And at the end of the day, it's going to be very difficult for me. There is no bigger Patriots fan than I know than me. And I was disappointed in the actions taken. And all that I can do is continue to hope that we find ways to look at solving things together, unite people, and put honor first. We've got some professors in this part of the country who are today calling for communist victory. And they say that's free speech. But they mean free speech only if you let them speak. They don't want anybody else to speak. And I tell you... Governor Wallace used to just love to use the long-haired hippie agitators, the, the folks who were out in the front lines of the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement. I love you too, I sure do. Oh, I thought you were a she, you a he, oh my goodness. The folks that he felt like his constituency uh, uh, just really disliked the most, you know. And when he was in California, a group of anarchists lay down in front of his automobile and threatened his personal safety, the president of the United States. Well, I want to tell you, if you will elect me the president, and I go to California, or I come to Arkansas, and some of them lie down in front of my automobile, it'll be the last thing they'll ever want to lie down in front of. That would be the kind of pictures that we would want. Well, just keep on. You get me a million votes every time you show up. I tell you that much. When that would be on television, and particularly back home in the South. Come up here after I've completed my speech, and I'll autograph your sandals for you. People would just want to just leave the cotton fields early in the afternoon and get to the television and send whatever dollars they had right into the campaign headquarters. And by doing that, we were able to finance the campaign. Why don't you young punks get out of the auditorium? Tell you what, I may not teach you any politics if you listen, but I'll teach you some good manners. I'll teach you some good manners, you know. I'll teach you some good manners. All right, and we back on the forecast. And I hope our people can realize the sense of urgency that we need to have right now, that we should have been had for like a couple hundred years right now. But right now, we have to start. We have to build our own economy. We have no more options. We have no more excuses. We don't have any reasons to not do that. But what we have to understand is whatever we build, whatever we do, somebody will be coming for it. And we have to be ready to protect ourselves. That is the one thing that we have lacked over and over. And it's causing us. It is causing us deaths that is very avoidable.
we do not have time to play. We do not have time for any extracurricular activity. We have to focus on empowering ourselves and putting our children in a position to be empowered and teach them how to protect themselves. So, as always, man, we have got to start standing for something or we're going to keep falling for anything.